left. So let's get some questions from the audience, please. And there are a couple of hands, because it's pretty well impossible for me to see as I gaze into the darkness here. But there are two hands up there if the microphones could come to them and if you could say who you are. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Memduh Karakulukcu from Istanbul. I want to uh, ask Volker about Sudan. It fits in with the sort of model I was playing with in the morning in the panel. What, I'm t uh, what I wasn't clear is that the way you painted the picture, it sounded like on economic, political, international affairs, all three fronts, things are moving in the right direction. Is it, I mean, that may or may not be accurate, but that is the way I perceived it. Is it because the population, the elite, learned from the mistakes of others and they actually substantively are delivering on the economy, the politics, and all the rest of it? Or is it a shift of attitude? Do the people, knowing what has happened elsewhere, are they more patient? Are they more tolerant? Are they more willing to allow time for all these efforts to uh, prosper, to give it fruit. Is, 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 is it, is, am I making myself clear? Is it actually a substantive change? Because that would be excellent news that things can be around, turned around within a few years versus it takes time, but if we change attitudes in the population, then it will allow things to go in the right direction in five, 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Volker, hold that thought and then the other question uh, in fact, there are two more. One, the, the, yes, uh, just there. Thank you very much. Yeah. I put my question now. Okay. Hervé Mariton from France. Uh, two quick questions to Madame Elkadbi. Uh, first, we're here in the Emirates, in a country with a large number of migrants. So how do you see uh, this factor evolving in the 10 years to come? I mean, the situation seems stable most of the time in most parts of the region but sometimes a bit more difficult in other countries in the Gulf. And so uh, is it something that you see as being decreased in the decade to come? Uh, is the uh, part of migrants in the country to increase? And how do you see uh, the life of these migrants in the country? I mean, the, the sort of proportion of the population you have here is the sort of thing we do not know in our countries. And it is uh, something of a strange uh, reality to us, and it's a, obviously a fact, an important factor of life in your country. Thank the second you. quick question is Very that interesting question, because yeah, I, um, the question, uh, let's, basically, if you take the Gulf states, other than Saudi Arabia, um, the population is largely immigrant. I mean, for example, in the UAE, I think the, populate, the, res, the citizen population is probably, what, 10%, um, and the same really Kuwait, Bahrain, a little higher, but that, so there's a great reliance upon immigrant residents. So what is the future development of society? Did well, I get that question correctly? Yeah, that, that the question is correct. Well, yeah. how, how do you say this evolving in the 10 years to come? Yeah. Is it a factor of stability or not? And a quick uh, other question. We've not, we have not been talking a lot about Saudi Arabia, and you have corrected this. We have not been talking a lot about Qatar. And Sorry about? Qatar. Qatar and, yeah. and it's obviously a tricky yeah. issue in the region as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then the third question, just there. It's actually a counterpart to, uh, Mr. Farid, yes. uh, to uh, Mr. Mariton's question. Do you see a role for Arab diasporas helping their home countries? Excellent. Okay, good question. Um, we have five minutes. Volker, you can start with your question. You only need a minute to answer that question. <laughs> Here we go. No, I don't think I need more. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mamadou, for the question. Um, I didn't want to create the impression that transition is an easy ride. Every step that has been taken in Sudan has to be negotiated between these partners in that marriage of reason. And it's every step is a difficult negotiation. But to your question, sort of, is it learning or attitude? Now, it's never absolute here, but I would tend to say it is learning. It is learning from the experiences of others. I mentioned Syria, I mentioned Libya, some other experiences. But it is also learning through marching forward on that path. Learning both 
that you cannot have a half or a 30% transition. I mean, you cannot build peace, well, you cannot build peace without having a peace agreement, but you cannot have a peace agreement without building peace, and you need an economy for that. You cannot have economic recovery without reintegrating with the rest of the world, and you will not be reintegrated in the rest of the world if you fall back into authoritarianism and dictatorship and defy rule of law. So everybody realizes that these dimensions are connected, and then, of course, people are learning from one another while they are moving forward. I would say, and to conclude with this, sort of on the cultural identity question, by opening up the political scene and by concluding peace agreements and by integrating former rebels into government, the Sudanese are also collectively realizing what pluralistic a country they actually are and that this could be an advantage and needs to be preserved. Thank you. Um, it's Sam, um, the floor is yours now. The question is if the one was about uh, what is the policy, how will it evolve on immigrant residents in the Gulf states? And the second question for you really uh, is about Qatar and I suppose um, the confrontation that existed between most of the GCC and Qatar, which is now, we hope, properly resolved. But there we are. That was, a, that was a, yeah, Qatar. Okay. Well, uh, in the beginning, I would say, uh, 80s, it was a dilemma how to manage that, okay? And, and there is a fear. And uh, try through emiratization. And then the government came to a conclusion that, well, you still need those uh, expats. And you have a small population, okay? And you are... Uh, enlarging your projects. So you have to decide. Uh, so that the decision, okay, we will have them and we will manage them well. Now we have 200 nationalities here, managing them very well. There is no conflicts. Even what happened in the 80s between the Indian and the Pakistani, it's not anymore there. Okay, engaging them that uh, uh, at the limit they feel they are part of this country, part of its stability. Uh, they fear if there's anything happened, that incident which happened that a woman has been killed that a uh, few years ago, everybody was feeling fear uh, on the stability of this country. The most uh, stable and security, uh, you will find it here in, in, in UAE. And there is a question, of course, about the uh, salaries, whatever, but still comparing, I'm always saying, comparing with their uh, original countries, they find themselves still they are a uh, winner here. Now, on the long run, the, the latest, which has been released, that the global emirs shows that we are going in that way, uh, managing our indigenous with the other uh, nationality. And no reverse about this. No back to 80s where we say we have to preserve our uh, identity and, and no others should, we should not let the comers, we should be the majorities. Cannot be. You cannot do it anymore now. Now regarding Qatar, I think uh, Dr. Anwar, uh, elaborate on that, but I would say also that it's always m basically between UAE and Qatar, it's uh, uh, the differences in the vision and in the role and the way. UAE always believed on the nation state. The Qataris believed on non-state actors. And so that's two ways, one promoting nation state, the other promoting non-state actors, uh, here we are talking the Muslim Brotherhood. So two different uh, rules. Plus between the Saudi and Qatari, well, Qatari always felt a threat from Saudi, a big countries behind them. And back to the clash between the 
two countries in 1995, there is always concern in the mind of the Qatar's leadership that Saudi always be a threat. So you have to contain Saudi either by being troublemakers or having a good uh, relation. Previous, it was not a good relation. Now the Qatar is also, all of us from that uh, rift, I would say all the countries realize it's, it's zero sum game. Nobody win. So that's why they came to that Al Ula summit and how to make it win win. And unfortunately, there's a, there are screens in front of us with big red letters saying time up. So we start a little late and we're going to finish um, a tiny bit late because despite this thing, I want each of you in 20 seconds to say what your dream is for 2030. Itamar, now it's a dream, 20 seconds. <clears throat> dream is uh, for, for a Middle East that enables its uh, young generation uh, to, f to find home in a hospitable place. Okay, good. Just 20 seconds. Uh, Volker. A deeply integrated, deeply economically and socially integrated region that could compete with Southeast Asia. Excellent. Uh, Mona, 20 seconds. Um, a young generation that will be up to compete with the, f with the Western generation in the new technology and the digitization in all their aspirations to be uh, at, this, at, a, at a par with them. Perfect. Uh, Bernardino. Uh, is to see the young diplomats in the region uh, designing the, the plans and, and the projects that will bring peace to the region uh, around 2013. Inshallah. Uh, if this time. A region without conflict based on sect or ethnicity. Region with uh, empowering citizenship. Excellent. Inshallah, we, it'll all happen. Thank you very much to this panel. I think it's extremely good. Thank you. <laughs>